you're a lot like your father. You really are, Peter, and that's a good thing. But your father lived by a philosophy, a principle, really. He believed that, that if you could do good things for other people, you had a moral obligation to do those things. That's what's at stake here. Not choice, responsibility. That's nice. That's, that's great. It's all well and good, so where is he? What? Where is he? Where's my dad? He didn't think it was his responsibility to be here to tell me this himself. Oh, come on, how dare you? How dare I? How dare you? Loneliness is like a double-edged sword. It's often linked to emotional states like depression, anxiety, or feelings of boredom and emptiness. But it's also a great source of creative courage because it's an intrinsic part of existence. Novelist Thomas Wolfe argued that coming to terms with it is often required in discovering and creating new forms and images. The Amazing Spider-Man centers on how this duality impacts the way we form our identities from teenagehood to adulthood because, unlike what came before and what came after, Peter Parker's story begins not by him accepting or declining an identity offered to him, but from his own lonely creative self-discovery, within a life specifically lacking in answers. So let's have fun and compare some Spider-Man again, although I don't get to talk about trauma so I'm only kind of meh right now. Man, you don't have me on your computer. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I had, I took a photo of the debate team, and you're in the debate team, so. You're touching him, Steph. Come on. I was, I was. Uh... The Amazing Spider-Man 1 is a really awkward movie to talk about because more so than the other two franchises, the business politics are far more transparent and intrusive. There are three key factors behind the production of the movie. First, Sony's licensing deal with Marvel was about to expire if they didn't exercise it, so the film was made out of legal necessity. Secondly, this was not the original desired production. Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 4 was in early development, but was cancelled when he couldn't get the time he wanted. Therefore, Mark Webb had to start a new series with even less planning time. And thirdly, there was an interest to solidify a cooperative relationship with Marvel Studios, because the Oscorp Tower was to appear in the Avengers, but unfortunately the design was not finished on time, therefore there was an aura of indecisiveness from the producer's end. And as I presented in part one, Sam Raimi and John Watt's Spider-Man differ greatly from each other in terms of media identities. Spider-Man 1 was a nostalgia film from the way it downplayed its contemporary aesthetics and presented a more simpler retro universe, where Old cars, old TVs, and old haircuts overwhelm the screen in order to draw upon the audience's own memories of the character. Whereas Spider-Man Homecoming was a piece of transmedia that played up its contemporary markers in order to complement the aesthetics of the wider MCU and to also obviously distinguish itself from previous adaptations. Both series had to communicate with the public imagination very differently and as a result, I present what I like to call the axis of intertextuality, where the vertical line draws upon the cultural memory of what came before and the horizontal line draws upon its cultural relationship with what's next to it. Spam Raimi's Spider-Man trilogy and the MCU Spider-Man occupy completely different areas because they fundamentally meet different audience demands and they're also motivated by very different creative opinions. Thank you, Mr. Sorry. Yes, Mr. Parker. Very well. But The Amazing Spider-Man occupies an extremely awkward place where it's almost right in the middle. It has such undesirable legal, creative, and cultural conditions that it knows that it can't draw too heavily on the past, like the previous franchise, otherwise it'll make itself redundant, but it's also quite unsure if it can or should lean heavily onto transmedia franchise building techniques because there's still the possibility that this could come from a good relationship with the competition, or it could come from purely within itself, where everything is managed and owned by Sony. Therefore, a lot of the movie's artistic decisions are immediately less creatively insulated because everything from tone to dialogue to story to even the way the costume looks has to be decisively indecisive. But to the credit of Mark Webb, his auteurist indie style is strong enough to penetrate through the corporate complications because either this is a happy coincidence or a deliberate artistic technique, the story's focus on loneliness actually complements its weird position on the axis. 
In the same way the movie cannot commit to either point, this interpretation of Peter Parker does not want to connect with people. Instead, he's someone who just sort of awkwardly longs for a good relationship. Come on, get a picture! Yes, come on! Therefore, the wall between the audience and the protagonist breaks down to an extent because everyone shares the same awkward feeling of isolation. And this is particularly galvanized by Mark Webb's signature of telling stories about youth and love because at the core of Amazing Spider Man 1 is a romantic story. What's your name? You don't know my name? No, I know your name. I just want to know if you know your name. Which is unsurprising because every live action Spider Man movie features one, although this time it's not the secondary interest but the main one, the thing that contextualizes everything else. If we were to break down the narrative in Act 1, aka The Departure, the first step of his journey or crossing the threshold, as Campbell called it, is not Peter leaving his old social wants behind, but actually having the will to pursue a social want in the form of developing a connection with Gwen. <laughs> As a result, in Act 2, The Initiation, where both Spider-Man 1 and Homecoming contextualizes Mary Jane and Liz Allen within the womanist temptress stage, since they both draw Peter's commitment away from being Spider-Man, Gwen is actually the total opposite. She doesn't create a division between Peter Parker and Spider-Man because Gwen is in on the secret. And it's precisely through sharing this burden that not only Peter Parker matures as a person, but the romance between them blossoms. Let's get out of here. Let's get out of here just for a minute, can we? Therefore, in contrast, Gwen Stacy represents Campbell's meeting with the goddess stage because she metaphorically guides him to become more vulnerable with people and also gives him the emotional strength to utilize it correctly. Correspondingly, this also then creates massive foundational differences in Act 3 for the reason that for Peter Parker to become the master of the two worlds, he has to go against Captain Stacy's wish and be with Gwen, otherwise he'll regress back to his old lonely self, untouched by the wisdom of the social. Everyone was there but you. Therefore Peter Parker's arc ends by letting the story go full circle. His story began with his parents leaving him with a broken promise. And now he breaks his promise to be there for Gwen. The film even spotlights this by bookending the story with two explicit time passes. So there are two ways to interpret this, either Peter Parker is becoming more like his parents by breaking his promise, or he's rejecting their path by actually coming back. And because of how oddly polysemic this is, it thematically touches upon both the messages from both Spider-Man 1 and Homecoming, because being Spider-Man can be read as being something inherited from family, or is based on the act of rejecting the direction of the previous generation and carving a new one. But unlike the other two films, this destination does not come from a lesson of humility, but from discovering an ambition. And thematically, this is the sharpest and most confident divergence in Mark Webb's interpretation, because unlike Sam Raimi's version, Peter Parker is not a natural asshole who needs the burden of guilt to keep him on the straight and narrow. I hurt her, Aunt May. I don't know what to do. Or John Watt's iteration, where he's naturally good but needs to recognize it in himself for once. Okay, so he must have known that I was not ready for something like this. Amazing contextualizes Spider-Man as merely a point of self-discovery, because this is a Peter Parker who, despite having decades of resentment burying him, he has a natural primal goodness inside him waiting to be released. <laughs> Furthermore, this desire to fight crime doesn't extend from an immediate reaction to his uncle's words, but from his natural altruism manifesting itself, because he specifically lets go of his personal search for justice to share it with everyone around him. The creation of the lizard even comes from his empathy for Dr. Connors, and then his partial redemption comes from a similar reciprocation. As a result, there's a distinct cozy feeling to the film's tone and optimism it generally has with people, in spite the element of despair that looms over it. This is solidified by the city of New York, which is now more of a character than the other two franchises. It's the guy who saved my boy on the bridge. Because where Raimi and Watts portrayed it as a stage with a wonderfully quirky personality, 
In Amazing, it's actually directly involved in the development of the plot. The city comes to Spider-Man's rescue, not because he's abstractly a member of it, but because the burden of responsibility is shared by everyone, from the father whose son was saved, Captain Stacy, to even Flash Thompson. Look, your uncle died. I'm sorry. As Peter Parker begins to share himself with the world, so does the world share itself with him. Because it's not a matter of with great power comes great responsibility, but responsibility is something expected even without any power. Which is why Uncle Ben never says it, and instead refers to it as a form of moral obligation. You had a moral obligation to do those things. That's what's at stake here. Speaking of Uncle Ben, this is another massive point of divergence. The story decenters Spider-Man's origin from him because he's no longer the moral anchor for everything. In the Raimi trilogy, he's a massive force of nature that consumed Peter Parker's life with both a beautiful dream and a horrible curse. In the MCU, Uncle Ben is never physically present, but he lives through inference. When Peter Parker explains his motives in Civil War, it's very clearly coming from a place of reactive guilt. And then the bad things happen. They happen because of you. And his relationship with Tony is clearly a symptom of trauma because he hasn't let go of being someone else's surrogate son. But in The Amazing Spider-Man, first, his paternal presence is overshadowed by Peter Parker's biological father. In fact, all of his words of wisdom are related to him. And secondly, the costume is not created in memory of Uncle Ben, but a strengthening relationship between Peter Parker's own creativity and the culture around him. As if the city is speaking to him. As a result, Uncle Ben exists more as a connective tissue now, a gateway between Peter Parker's naturally good soul and the goodness of the outside world. And to show us that there is something greater at play, that this is a Spider-Man that is not created by circumstance, but by destiny. Peter Parker, if there's one thing you are, it's good. In conclusion, Amazing Spider-Man's weird legal position forced the movie to be in a very weird, isolated position, where it can't quite fully draw upon a consistent and deep well of meaning, but to an extent, if you're immensely forgiving, this enhances what it tries to explore, because that's what it's ironically artistically about. Peter Parker can never truly know who he is, because that is the natural order of the world, but he can know what he can become, and um, yeah, they, they kind of oddly complement each other. Although I know this joke is getting old, but seriously, now that I've done Andrew Garfield's interpretation, and I feel like I can finally, truly, and honestly pick my favourite live-action Spider-Man. And it would have to be Italian Spider-Man. first time. Then you got them both the second time. Oh. This is the one? <laughs> <laughs>